Thank you for checking out this sermon video here at Hope Church. We're excited that you came across this message and are tuning in. You are joining us for our series called Radical Red Letters, Kingdom Living in a Chaotic Land. If you're joining us for the first time, I want to be the first to say, welcome to Hope Church. Do us a favor and text new to hope to 94090. After you hit send, you'll get an immediate response from our team with a link to a short form for you to fill out so we can get to know you better. Once again, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the sermon. For the past several weekends, we have been walking together as a family of faith through one of the most famous sermons Jesus ever preached called the Sermon on the Mount. Actually, we've just been studying the first section of that sermon that has become known as the Beatitudes. And we gave you a definition when we started this series of the Beatitudes, and I want to, as we bring it to a close today, I want to give you that definition one final time. The Beatitudes were eight radical declarations of kingdom living resulting in contentment in the midst of the chaos. We entitled this series, Radical Red Letters, Kingdom Living in a Chaotic Land. And what a word this has been over these eight weekends for our fellowship in the midst of where we're living in the world today. And I think it's so relevant because when we began the series, we looked at the opening section of this message and we learned that Jesus actually was stepping into a very similar situation. When Jesus began his public ministry, the world was in chaos. There was political chaos. There was spiritual chaos. There was physical and emotional chaos taking place. That's the world that Jesus stepped into. And what you find in the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus bringing his disciples, his followers up on a hillside to teach them about a radically different way of living a way of life that was different than the chaos of the world that they were experiencing around them. And that's what these Beatitudes are, these radical declarations. John Stott, a a scholar and theologian I like to read, listen to what he said about the Sermon on the Mount. He said, the Sermon on the Mount is the nearest thing to a manifesto that Jesus ever uttered. For it is his own description of what he wanted his followers, listen to this, to be and to do. There's what we find in the Beatitudes. There's what these radical declarations are. What we're to be as Christ followers and then how we're to live that out in our everyday lives. So let me say it to you this way. The Beatitudes are who we are in Christ And what we do as we allow Christ to live his life through us. Now, here's what this means. And this is very important. These radical declarations that we have been walking through for eight weekends are not suggestions that Jesus is laying on the table for you and I to pray about. Over the last eight weekends, as we've unpacked these beatitudes, these radical declarations of Jesus, being poor in spirit, being merciful, being hungering and thirsting for righteousness, these are not things that you and I need to go, you know what, I'm going to pray about whether or not that's going to be a part of my life. No, what these are, are declarations by Jesus that describe who we are in Christ and then what it looks like as Christ lives his life through us. Here's what this means. To not live this way is sin. Sin is rebellion against God. We often think sin is simply doing that which I know I'm not supposed to do. And that is sin. But sin is also not doing what I know I've been called to do. James, the half-brother of Jesus, writes it this way in James chapter 4 and verse 17. He says, therefore, to the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it to him, it is, say it out loud, sin. Meaning when we know what the right thing is and we don't do it, it is sin. It's rebellion against God. When my life doesn't resemble this description of, by Jesus of kingdom living in the Beatitudes, it's clear evidence that I'm not allowing the Holy Spirit of God to be in control. How many of you know that as a Christian, every day there's a battle on the inside between the Spirit of God living in me and my flesh? If you know that, say amen. Amen. 
If you don't know that, I'm wondering whether or not you're really a Christian, right? Because every Christian knows there's a very real battle every day between my flesh that still longs for the things of this world, my flesh that still wants what it wants, and the Spirit of God in me who's now conforming me to the image of Christ. Paul described it this way. He said in Galatians chapter 5, but I say walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Anybody can say amen. I feel that, right? We all, as followers of Jesus, have this battle between Christ in us and the longings of our flesh. And here's what we're learning about the Beatitudes. As you and I die to ourselves... And allow Christ to live his life through us. Here's what it looks like. The Beatitudes. When the flesh is in control, it doesn't look like the Beatitudes. So we've been studying this now for five weekends. I want to bring it to a close with looking at the last Beatitude today. So open your Bible to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to begin in verse 1. And as we walk through reading this text one final time... I'm going to give you the definitions again of each of these statements just to refresh your memory. So it begins in verse 1. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, here's the first one, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We said to be poor in spirit is to recognize one's own spiritual poverty apart from God's amazing grace. Meaning this, the only hope I have of living out these beatitudes is not my willpower and my strength. The only hope I have is as I live in dependence on the amazing grace of God being poor in spirit. Verse 4, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. We said to mourn means to be a brokenness before God, born out of truth revealed through my fellowship with him. Verse 5, blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Gentleness we define as the overflow of brokenness before God that expresses itself and my surrender to him and my submission to others. And with this phrase, submission to others, we, we talked about in every way I relate to you, I'm to consider you more important than me. Remember that? Now, here's the deal. That's not the natural tendency of our flesh, right? The natural tendency of my flesh is, in every way I relate to you, I'm more important than you, right? But the Spirit of God produces in us the life of Christ that says, in every way I relate to you, you're more important than me. Verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. To hunger and thirst for righteousness is a passionate longing to see the righteousness that is mine in Christ be experienced in my life, in my relationships, and in the world. Verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. To be merciful is an attitude, an action of kindness towards the undeserving. Anybody can be kind when people deserve kindness. It's Christ in us that allows us to be kind even to the undeserving. Verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. It's an internal wholeness that results in an external holiness. We talked about integrity. Then last weekend, verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. What's a peacemaker? We said it's one who takes responsibility for reconciling broken relationships. And last weekend, I challenged you, Jesus is a peacemaker. Our enemy, the devil, is a troublemaker. Who do you more resemble? Amen? We got a peacemaker that's our king. We got a troublemaker that's our enemy. When we're living out of the overflow of Christ in us, we're about pursuing reconciliation where there are broken relationships. When we're living out of the overflow of our flesh, it looks a lot like our enemy. We become troublemakers. The Beatitudes, here's what I want you to see in this review, are simply the life of Jesus in us being lived through us. But as we bring this to a close, here's what you got to know. The world rejected Jesus. The Beatitudes are Christ in us 
being lived through us. But if you know the story of Scripture, the world nailed Jesus to a cross. So let's read the last three verses in this section of Scripture called the Beatitudes, where we're going to focus today. Blessed are those who have been persecuted. Notice something. The first seven Beatitudes describe what we do, kindness, gentleness, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, reconciling relationships, peacemaking. It's what we do as we allow Christ in us to live through us. The last beatitude is not about what we're doing, but about what will be done to us as we live out this radical expression of the kingdom. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice. (laughs) That doesn't even feel like that's the right word that ought to be there, right? You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be insulted. They're going to say things about you. Rejoice. I told you this stuff's radical. It doesn't make sense in the world. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward in heaven is great. From the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The first seven Beatitudes describe who we are as Christ lives through us. The last Beatitude describes how we'll be received and reacted to by the world around us as we live out Christ's life. This is not the only place Jesus gave us this warning. As a matter of fact... In John chapter 15, listen to what Jesus said. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, I chose you out of the world. Because of this, the world hates you. So we're going to dig into this last beatitude today the same way we have each of them. I'm going to ask and answer two questions We're going to understand what it is to be persecuted, and then we're going to talk about what our response as we live in this world should be to persecution. So we're going to wrestle with these two questions. But here's why I believe this is so timely for us as a church today and for the church really in America today. We're living in the midst of an unusual year. There's a lot of stuff that we're all facing economically, politically, physically, socially. There's all kinds of stuff. But what we're going to be able to do today is compare and contrast that to what believers in the world have walked through throughout the course of history that hopefully will give us a sense of where we are in the big picture of what God's doing in the world. So first of all, let me ask the question, what is persecution? Jesus said, blessed are those who have been persecuted. The word persecution here is a word that comes from a root word that means to run hard after. It means to pursue. It means to chase. This word here, the way it's written in the Greek language, means to pursue with repeated acts of hostility. It means to chase after someone to harass them. Now, before I really unpack a definition of what persecution is, let me tell you what persecution is not. Persecution is not being made fun of for having 65 Christian bumper stickers on your car. Persecution is not being unfollowed on social media because you post too many Bible verses. Persecution is not simply going through a difficult season in your life. Persecution is not 
self-inflicted hardship because I arrogantly shove my convictions down everyone else's throat. The scripture says we're to speak the truth in love, not speak the truth in your face. Persecution is not being confronted by a brother or sister in Christ because of an area of sin in my life. That's what they're supposed to do. That's not persecution. So then, Pastor, what is persecution? Well, I want to give you a three-part statement to define it, and here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Don't tune me out till we get all the way to the end because you're going to hear part of this and go, well, wait a minute, that's not all that persecution is. I know there's three parts to the statement, all right? So let me get all the way to the end. Here's the first part. Persecution is suffering for Christ. There are two very important phrases that Jesus uses. Look at verse 10. Blessed are those who who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. And then in verse 10, he says, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you because of me. In both of those instances, the same Greek word is used. One time it's translated for, the other time it's because of. But in both of those, it's a Greek word that means here's the reason why. Jesus said persecution always has the same motive, and the motive is always Jesus. One time he calls it righteousness. Persecution is the response of the unbelieving world to the righteous character of God revealed in our lives as Christ is made manifest through the power of the Holy Spirit. Persecution is not a rejection of you or me. Persecution is a rejection of Jesus himself. Persecution is always suffering for Christ. Secondly, persecution is suffering for Christ physically. We're believers today. If you're a Christian, if you're here and you consider yourself to be a follower of Jesus, you're a Christian today because there are men and women of God who've come before you, who were willing to stand strong in the face of immense persecution. They had an unwavering conviction that people would know the good news of Jesus more than anything else in life. They were willing to die to their comfort. They were willing to die to their convenience. They were literally willing to die so that you and I could hear the message of Jesus. The Bible records it in in Hebrews chapter 11 like this. Listen to what it says. And it says, the writer here says, and others, that's all we know about them, just others. They don't have their names mentioned in Scripture. Others experience mockings and scourgings. Yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated. I love this line. Men and women of whom the world was not worthy. The word men, here's a word that refers to all people. These men and women of God who gave their lives Then he says, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. Here's what I want you to know. What we just read, if you're a Christian, this is the history of your family. There are brothers and sisters in Christ who you'll never know their name this side of eternity, who literally were willing to die so that you and I could hear the gospel And Jesus could save us and be our Lord and take us to heaven someday with him. The sad reality is the church in America can't get over the inconvenience of masks and having to register to come to a church service. We think somehow that's great persecution. (laughs) Every one of the followers of Jesus, the first followers of Jesus died for the sake of the gospel. The original disciples, those first that he called to himself, all of them died. Six were crucified. Andrew, Peter, Thaddeus, Philip, Simon, and Bartholomew all were crucified. 
for preaching the gospel. James, the son of Zebedee, had his head cut off for preaching the gospel. James, the son of Alphaeus, was beaten and drug outside the city and stoned to death. Matthew and Thomas, Matthew that wrote the gospel we're reading from, Matthew and Thomas were both killed as they ran a sword and a spear through them and executed them. John is the only disciple who died of natural causes, but John died of natural causes because he was exiled to an island all alone by himself for preaching the gospel. They banished him from human society, and he died out there on that island all by himself. Even Paul, the great missionary that wrote much of the New Testament, Paul, the one that first brought the gospel to Gentiles, which many of us find ourselves in that category, non-Jewish people. Many of us came to know Christ because of the apostle Paul. Paul got to Rome and he preached the gospel and in Rome they cut his head off and Paul was executed. I'm afraid we hear this and we often think that's simply ancient history. That persecution of Christians is something that happened a long time ago, but according to one organization that I love and pray for called Open Doors, it's a, a Christian organization that works among the persecuted church in the world. As we sit here in 2020, there are 260 million Christians living in over 50 countries around the world today who wake up every day in fear of their lives being taken simply for following Jesus. I want to show you two numbers. First number is 2,983. That's the number of Christians who in the last year have been murdered for simply following Jesus. That's eight Christians every single day. And listen to this. They read the same Bible you and I read. They love the same Jesus that you and I love. They worship the same God that you and I worship. They preach the same gospel that you and I preach. And yet 2,983 of them this year lost their lives for simply doing that. show you another number. 9,488. That's the number of churches that have been burned to the ground or destroyed around the world in the last 12 months simply for being Christian churches. We're not talking about ancient history. The top 10 countries where it's most dangerous to follow Jesus, according to Open Doors, due to extreme persecution, are North Korea, Afghanistan, Somalia, Libya, Pakistan, Eritrea, Sudan, Yemen, Iran, and India. And here's what I want you to know, family of faith. Church, because of your generosity, as you give, as you pray, as you go, you need to know your church family, Hope Church, we are actively involved in five of those ten nations. We are actively involved partnering with believers, partnering with workers on the field, supporting, praying for, resourcing men and women of God who are literally laying their lives on the line every day for the sake of the gospel. Because you're a part of this fellowship, when you give, when you pray, you're joining in the activity of God with men and women of whom the world is not worthy. I'll tell you one story in particular. We have a partner that we've been working with at Hope now for 20 years in South Asia. I've known him for about 25 years. He's a national from South Asia. I met him uh, 25 years ago when we started the church here. We began to partner with him and he lives in a country that's somewhat open to the gospel marginally but he's given his life to smuggling himself into some other countries in South Asia where he's been involved planting churches where there were no churches, taking the gospel where they never heard the gospel. And in our partnership with him over the last 20 years, he's seen over 10,000 churches planted among unreached peoples that had never had access to the gospel before. But I'll tell you the story of one of those men. One of those men preached the gospel. and It was in the country that our partner was smuggling himself into He's preaching the gospel and planting churches and the local officials took him and they arrested him. They beat him. 
And the first thing they did is they took a wooden stock, like something you see out of the old movies, and they put him hands and feet and neck in this wooden stock in the center of the village. And they put him there as an example, night and day. Didn't take him out at night. He stood there night and day for days on end, just hanging there in that wooden stock. They said, all you have to do to be set free is stop preaching the gospel. And here's this guy in this wooden stock in the middle of the village, and he just continued to preach the gospel. So they took him, they threw him in jail. He spent several years in a dark dungeon cell, isolated from sunlight to the point that he he physically went blind because his eyes had no access to light for years. Lost his eyesight. And all he had to do, they told him every day, they'd go in and say, all you have to do to be set free is renounce Jesus and stop preaching the gospel. He wouldn't stop. Not only that, while he was in prison, his wife started 30 new churches. Let me tell you who those people are. They're men and women of whom the world is not worthy. And may God have mercy on the church in America who thinks somehow we're being mistreated because we have to socially distance when we come to church. While we're sitting in a world where brothers and sisters are laying their lives on the line for the sake of of the gospel persecution is suffering for christ physically here's the last part of the statement persecution is suffering for christ physically emotionally and or mentally although you and i may not be facing persecution physically today in america we are facing persecution in other ways as our nation continues to drift from a biblical worldview The more we as believers stand up and speak the truth in love, the more we will face persecution. Jesus here describes two forms, insults and false accusation. It's saying hurtful, wrong things. It's attacking abusively with words. It's lying and and in wicked ways, distorting the truth about believers. Jesus said, as we continue to speak the truth in love, we will face persecution. When we as believers stand for life, whether it be life in the womb of a mother or the life of a young black man in the inner city or the life of a police officer serving and protecting his or her city in a society that is rapidly devaluing human life made in the image of God, the more we stand for life, the more we will be persecuted. As we as followers of Jesus stand for the truth that God created human beings, male and female, in his image. And we hold to the divine truth that marriage is an institution created by God, designed by God between a man and a woman. And it is not to ever be redefined regardless of any constitutional attempt to do so. We will be persecuted. When we say that there is only one way to know God, and that is through his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, in a world that says all religions are the same, you need to understand we will be persecuted. May not be physical yet, but emotionally, mentally, we've enjoyed in America In previous generations, a place where you could be Christian and it didn't necessarily oppose the thinking of the day, but over the last few decades and where we're headed as a nation, we are moving away from a biblical worldview on issues that the scripture is very clear about. Let me tell you what's going to happen. The church in America will be purified. The spectators will not be around to spectate. Only those who follow Jesus and love Jesus and consider the gospel more important than anything else will be those that stay. So then that raises the second question. I'll close with this. How do we respond? How should we respond to persecution as followers of Jesus? Well, we could literally do an entire series on this question So what I'm going to do is limit my points to the two things Jesus says in these verses. Number one, we should not be surprised. Look at verse 10. Jesus said in verse 11, Jesus said, when. 
not if you're persecuted. It's important. Jesus didn't state this as it might happen. He stated it as it will happen. And here's what's happened. We, we've been so influenced in the American church by a prosperity gospel. Now, I know many of us would say we don't believe a prosperity gospel, this gospel that says if you believe Jesus, you'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise. But we've been so influenced by a prosperity gospel that the moment some suffering, the moment the slightest discomfort comes into our life, we look at God like, what's going on here? I thought we were on the same team. I thought this all was going to be glorious all the time for me. We shouldn't be surprised. Let me show you a promise in the Bible. And I, I, let me make you a promise about this promise. You won't find it in any book, any little devotional, 365 wonderful promises of God for you to meditate on daily, all right? You'll never find this in that book. Look what it says. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, I know some of you are writing this down because you want to go home and claim this this afternoon. And <laughs> I, listen, I get I know this is heavy. But Christian, listen, you shouldn't be surprised when the world rejects Christ in you. Here's the second thing. Not only should we not be surprised, we should be glad. Uh, Pastor, wait a minute. Could you say that one more time? Yeah, here it is. We should be glad. Jesus twice says, you will be persecuted. And then he says, rejoice! It's a word that literally means to be exceedingly glad. And as if that word wasn't enough, he says, and be glad. The word be glad here is a Greek word that literally speaks to leaping much. It's talking about the kind of joy where you're jumping up and down. You're so happy. Jesus says, mark it down. Don't be surprised. You will be persecuted. Why? Because they hated me. They will hate you. When it happens, what do we do? We rejoice. Why in the world should we rejoice? Let me give you three reasons and we're done. Number one, it deepens our intimacy with Christ. There are things about Jesus we will never learn apart from the valley of persecution and suffering. You see, when God saved you, salvation is not a get-out-of-hell-free card. Salvation is an invitation to know God that changes you in this life and takes you into heaven in the next life. But it's an invitation to intimacy with God. So the, the real desire of the Father is that you and I know Him intimately. Paul captured this. Paul wanted to know Christ. Listen what he said. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And that's where we all say, yeah, give me some of that. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. But listen, there can't be a resurrection without a death. And the fellowship of his suffering. I don't know if I want to know him like that. There's a sweetness about intimacy with Jesus that makes even persecution something the believer can say, boy, I'm glad. I'm glad. Number two, it gives us an opportunity to demonstrate the love of Jesus. Matthew chapter 5, a little later on in this chapter, Jesus says something that's absolutely remarkable. You want to talk about radical. Listen to these words. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, <laughs> punch him back. No, that's not what it says, is it? <laughs> that's what the flesh says. 
Turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, you go with him too. You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who's in heaven. For he causes his son to rise and on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors do that? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you're to be perfect as your heavenly fathers. Perfect. Now, I know what you're thinking because I think it too when I read that. I can't do that. <laughs> Let me let you in on some good news. You're right. You can't. And I can't. But the Christ who lives in us can. And when this world sees that, they say, I don't know what you have, but I want what it is that you have. Number three, we're done. It reminds us this world is not our home. Here's why we can be glad when persecution comes. It's just one of those reminders. Oh, yeah, I get pretty comfortable down here, but I just got reminded this, this isn't it. Today is not forever. The world is not the end of the story. Jesus said, rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. In the early 1900s, there was a missionary couple that had served 30 years in Africa. They'd suffered. They were persecuted. They, they were attacked for preaching the gospel and planting churches in Africa. In the early 1900s, they, they were retiring as missionaries after 30, 40 years, four decades on the mission field. They're coming home to America. They booked passage on a ship that would arrive in New York City. They didn't realize it, but they actually booked passage on the same ship that President Teddy Roosevelt was on returning from a big game hunt in Africa. They arrive at the shores of America, New York City, to all this fanfare, people by the thousands, flags waving, bands playing, celebrating the arrival of the president home to America. And here's this little missionary couple gave 40 years of their lives, faced suffering, persecution, hardship, difficulty, Walking off that ship and nobody's there to meet him. The man looks at his wife and says, that's it. I've had enough. It's not right. He was just hunting. We, we gave our lives and nobody's here to greet us when we get home. Takes his wife home frustrated. She finally says, you got to go upstairs and just be with God. You need to go talk to him about this. He goes upstairs for a few hours alone with God. He, he comes back downstairs with a completely different countenance. She says, honey, what, what happened? He, she, he, said, he said, I met with God. She said, what did God say? He said, it was as if God put his hand on my shoulder and said, son, remember, you're not home yet. You're not home yet. This world is not the end of the story. And listen to what Paul said about it. Paul said in Romans chapter 8 and verse 18, he said, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us there. Here's what that means. It's like comparing an apple to a house. There's just no comparison. Blessed are those who've been persecuted. I've never really seen this rejoicing principle lived out better than I did when I read a poem written by a young girl in the mid-1990s. Her name is Dora Tenenoff. Her father, Rick Tenenoff, was a missionary with an organization called New Tribes Mission. He and a few men had gone on a remote trip into the villages on the border of Panama and Colombia to preach the gospel to peoples that had never heard about Jesus before. 
while there, they were taken captive. And at the time of Dora's writing of this poem, her father Rick and a few other men had been held captive for a few years, not knowing if they were dead or alive for preaching the gospel. Dora sits down and she writes this poem that I think think so reflects the truths we've talked about this morning. Listen to what she said. The title of it is, There Once Was a Man. There once was a man, a man I once knew, who told me stories every night, laughed at my jokes and held me tight. He told me, don't quit, always fight the good fight. He said, love the Lord with all your heart and serve him with all your might. He begged me, do right. There once was a man, a man I once knew, who taught me how to tie my shoe and gently smiled at every picture that I drew. He told me, when you start something, don't stop until the job is through. He said, I love you. There once was a man, a man I once knew. I saw him in my dream and it made me scream. I called out, Daddy! But he told me nothing. He had nothing to say. For what can you say when you're far, so very far away? Daddy, I said. Then a voice echoed in my head. I lay quiet and still in my bed. Again the voice, your daddy made a choice. A choice to serve me with all his might, to not give up and to fight the good fight. He's doing a job for me and it is not yet through. So remember, I love you. There's now a man, a man I now know. He lived and he died to save men from their sin. He made it possible for us to be born again. I know because my daddy told me so. And even though he's no longer here, my God will always be dear to fill in the gaps and show me which way to go. I miss my dad so much, but God has a plan. So for now, I'll just wait and watch the work of his hand. There once was a man, a man I once knew. He's now just a memory slowly fading away. Dead or alive, you ask? I don't know. So I beg you, please pray. Pray for my daddy that he knows every night I whisper, Daddy, I love you. There's now a man, a man I now know. Every day he becomes more real to me. Every day in him I grow. Every day I pray that my love for him will show I've made a choice to serve him with all my might, to not give up to fight the good fight. Here on earth, I may not see my dad again, but that's all right. Because when my life is through, I'll finally hear them both say, my child, I love you. Blessed are those who have been persecuted. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven.